Thank you for the introduction and allowing me to present the AT Still Memorial Lecture. I'm truly honored by the Board of Trustees and the entire osteopathic profession for entrusting me with this message. One of AT Still's most significant contributions was the idea that health, and therefore health care, was a living and changing phenomenon. He understood it was too easy to identify disorder and challenged fellow doctors to work in harmony, not for one part, but for the whole. Dr. Stowe worked tirelessly to understand the medical norms, transform them, and he engineered pathways to practice. He was quoted to have said, he had no desire to be a cat, which walked so lightly it created no disturbance. Dr. Still knew that to evolve healthcare, we must be an ember of change. The ideas of history, opportunity, and innovation were ingrained in him, and they illuminate the path forward for this profession. Very quickly, I'll take a moment to introduce myself and how I got here. My name is Sarah Julian Wolf, proud doctor of osteopathic medicine. I've been practicing broad spectrum family medicine in Oregon for the last three years, and I love it here not only because of the breadth of family medicine that exists, but I'm close to my family. It all starts with my husband, Alex. He's a strong example of an osteopathic advocate, and he has continued to support me and this profession since medical school. His unwavering support and our two kids have provided me a stable foundation throughout my career. I'd like to tell you I was osteopathically bound from the beginning, but it's not completely true. I was all set to apply to allopathic school, you know, suit purchased, money paid, essay written, and I had a sudden shift of momentum. Believe it or not, it was an allopathic physician that changed my direction. He was a friend's dad, an allopathic residency director, someone I had never met, but I would take any advice at that time. He was the last to read my admissions essay, and he sent it back with an unexpected message. You're applying to the wrong school. You want to be a DO. It's everything you wrote about. Choose a new path. In just a few paragraphs, he recognized my true passion, encouraged my strengths, and directed me to a profession that would exemplify the qualities. Osteopathic medicine wasn't exactly prominent in my state of Oregon. But my essay was about a trip to Africa where I had this amazing experience. I saw a young boy with a terrible case of malaria. I was so proud to treat him. I got up to prescribe his medicines, and the mom refused. I don't want your me Western medicine, she said. They don't work. He's taken them before, and he's still sick. It was a shocking reaction, and I'm sure my face turned white. Why wouldn't she want this medicine? It's clearly going to help her child. And it took me a moment to realize what had occurred. People like myself had come with their Western pharmaceuticals, handed them a pill, and walked away, feeling very good about ourselves. No one told this family about the disease process, the treatments, the prevention strategies, and it broke my heart. I realized the disservice that we were providing for this family, and I reflected on it later that evening. I thought to be glad that I was in the U.S., where this wasn't a problem. But the more I thought, the more I realized the theme of the magic pill was present at home. I wrote about this in my essay, and I mentioned that stories like it were the exact reason I went into medicine. Fueled by my mission, I spoke to goals of teaching people to take care of themselves, and only assisting when necessary. At the end of the day, I wanted to do more than dispense pills. I wanted to journey with my patients through the complexity and depth and conditions of a person, not the symptoms of a patient. That allopathic residency director, he read this and understood my mission without me even acknowledging it. Soon I was accepted to Western University of Health Sciences, College of Osteopathic Medicine of the Pacific in Southern California. The school's reputation was great, the training was innovative, and its proximity to Disneyland had me sign the deal. Much like many of you, I was never someone who could sit back and watch things unfold, so I immediately got involved. I always wanted to be part of the process an active player in all of my journeys. I always thought if I may be able to help and if there was a chance, I might as well try. That's probably the reason I was drawn to medicine in the first place. I wanted to continue to advocate for my patients, but also my cohort and profession. As a student, I tried to stay abreast of the greater things in medicine, but really I was more focused on the narrow topics that pertain to me. I wasn't sure where this would take me, be it the AOA or advocacy, but suddenly I was in the rooms to sign deciding and discussing the union and intersection of osteopathic identity and single GME. I may not be able to talk too much or had intimate knowledge of practicing, but I could speak to the topics on my mind, and for me, that was residency. I watched this house approve 
after rejecting the single accreditation system and then worked to implement it. I was consistently reminded of why I chose osteopathic medicine by the good people I continued to be around. I wanted to be the physician who treated the whole patient in new ways. I wanted to embody the osteopathic philosophy. And I'm proud to say that's happening in my career today. There are many times I like correcting the passing by patient or even administrator who may call me an MD. I probably shouldn't like it as much, but it gives me a chance to explain that I'm different and I chose a path that honors that. The biggest thing I can offer my patients is my connection to them. I can go in there and I can diagnose them or I could not. I could order a lab or I could not. I could arrange expensive tests to add to the expense of healthcare, or I could not. But I am going into the room to listen, emphasize, and connect with my patients every time. To me, that's the osteopathic way. That's why my patients see me and I get far more cookies than anyone in my office. I even have one or two books my patients have brought. To me, I'm part of their lives. I'm not just that doctor handing out medicines. It's so much more. It's what my osteopathic training cultivated. I'm sure you could feel it too. In today's medical system, it feels like there's an undertow pulling us away from our osteopathic ideals. Systems and financials push us to see more and more patients with a consequence of less and less time for connection. This realization is probably one of the biggest challenges I've had to stay steadfast in my career. But I haven't given up my osteopathic identity. My patients love to see me, and at the end of the day, I love seeing them. The time in the room is amazing and invaluable, and as osteopathic physicians, we need to continue to cultivate that and make sure we have that connection. I really wanted to be the change in high quality care. So I signed on to a clinic that was based in innovation. They were doing things completely different from three years ago. I was doing virtual care, value-based care. I scheduled on complexity and I did something that I've termed active panel management. All of this was because I needed to be part of the change the trials leading medicine in a new direction. It was easy to get bogged down in the paperwork and the policies and reimbursements, but we can't let all those things get in the way of delivering research-based treatments to a whole patient that's cost-effective and innovative. So what do we do in today's healthcare model? How do we truly deliver value-based care? It's simple. We harness our history and opportunities and innovations. We embraced our path as we walk through the future of quality given care. A.T. still lived through war. He saw death and epidemics. and He knew there was a better way. He chose to put aside old methods of healing and was steadfast in the solution. He innovated, questioned, and tested new theories, practicing these all for the benefits of his patients and his family. He wasn't afraid to push the balance of medicine in a new direction or see a vision that no one else could. It's this willingness that need not be ignored by the profession, but embraced. There's new opportunities in teamwork, technology, and innovation that we all must look at. And we can use that to solve our problems. I'll start with teamwork. The entire healthcare team needs to be invested as one. Each physician, despite specialty, should work together to cover preventative health gaps, high-risk codes, reduction of polypharmacy, and when necessary, de-escalation of care. We can help our patients avoid disease through prevention, but currently the burden falls through payment incentives and responsibility around primary care alone. So we all know specialists have a huge role in the overall health of our patients, and we need to get them aligned around these goals. We also need to not just think about life, but the important transition beyond it. Let's have discussions in advance with our patients, their families, and each other to avoid an unexpected terminal event that burdens loved ones. And in regards to high-functioning interprofessional teams, we must maintain that as physicians, our name and place signifies the extensive training and knowledge that comes with our rigorous education. Next, we're going to talk about EHRs. Technology has a big piece of this innovation that is the next phase of healthcare. EHRs were implemented to improve healthcare, and now they're one of the leading causes of burnout. Let's lower this death by paper cuts click count and design a healthcare record that focuses around patient care, ease of documentation, automated reminders for follow through. And by doing this, we will increase quality and decrease the burden. The current focus of the EMR is rooted in billing alone. 
It prompts us to focus our attention on the patients that we're seeing that day, those billable visits that everyone wants us to get. That usually only occurs with the most engaged patient. Having a symptom that pri- system that prioritizes patient outcomes and awareness of the entire panel will help catch those who need us the most, the ones that often slip through the cracks and are never on our schedules to begin with. This change alone would move EMRs into a supportive role in achieving that triple aim. Finally, we're going to discuss a little bit about innovation. Research opportunities have to be more widely available inside and outside typical academic settings. We all should be constantly pushing towards medical advancements and the increase of evidence-based medicine. This means that we need to have research for pharmaceuticals, OMT, and beyond everywhere. Bringing research and investigational opportunities outside the typical silos and academic settings will allow for swifter advancements in evaluation and identifying optimal treatments. If there's anything good that came out of COVID, it's the opportunity for these three things. Teamwork, technology, and innovation took leaps forward. Much like the viral meningitis of A.T. Still's day, COVID was sink or swim. It pushed a lot of people to innovate around technology and teamwork. It might have looked very different by where you were in the country, but there wasn't a physician among us who wasn't touched by the disease. Some practices held on to traditional models, and some were embraced or absolutely pushed into change. Clinics and hospitals either embraced the next move or worked harder than ever to stay the traditional course. Either way, our patients needed us. We would continue to care for them the best way resources allowed. We worked hard for our patients, each one of us, and it became a strange dichotomy of the personal feeling of being victimized were touted as that hero. For a moment, it seems that we would all self-unify and self-regulate for the good of all, but then suddenly it started to change and crumble. Science and medicine have some become somehow become polarized and politicized in my short medical tenure thanks to COVID. Facts became personal opinions and public health topics fractured personal and professional associations. As DOs and leadership of the AOA, it is our turn to step outside the turbulence of politics. We must rise above the fray of the media and show that we stand for the good and health of our patients. We must focus our attention not on decisive affairs, but on the patient-physician relationship, the thing that unifies us and guides us as our North Star. In 2020, the rest of the world began to appreciate the osteopathic lens of health. COVID impacted people, their families, and society. It wasn't just the cough. COVID impacted the ability to financially survive and impacted people's ability to be around friends, in turn, changing their mental health, both mind and spirit. Osteopathic physicians have always known it wasn't about the lack of cough syrup. It was about the disease's impact on the physical and emotional structure and function of someone's life. As strategies evolved to overcome the pandemic, the osteopathic voice became loud. Let's use that momentum and show our relevance and importance as physicians and leaders of our healthcare team. As the time progresses, osteopathic physicians are situated particularly well to continue to drive the politics of medicine. In the past, we might have fought for seats at the table, but now the meetings are occurring around our schedules. Partly because the viewpoints that we've always held sacred, partly because our dedication to primary care, but mostly it's because how we deliver care, our ways of looking at people and not patients. As we get called to lead, we must embrace and showcase our distinctly osteopathic identity. Healthcare is looking for answers. We continue to provide patient-centered direction. We must proudly show the significance of our ideals in the processes we create. And when the osteopathic name is disparaged, we need not to tune it out, but respond in force, protecting our name. We have always been a powerful voice. We must continue to illuminate our distinctive identity. There are several ways to be that voice of the profession and keep our momentum moving forward, but we need to increase unity and involvement. The 2021 DO Day on the Hill was a success despite its untraditional nature. More than 600 physicians and trainees logged on and legislators heard about the challenges we were facing. We asked for the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021 to include additional funding for THC GME. Congress listened and supported us with 330 million. On the state level, AOA and its affiliates battle issues like scope of practice and medical billing. And in local communities, DOs serve on city councils, raise money for charities, volunteer at school events, and so much more. It is these continued engagements that disseminate the positive message of osteopathic medicine. 
It's the showcase of our history, opportunity, and innovation. Just as important as understanding and providing external value and appreciation for DOs, is understanding of who we are and how we have changed. As our profession looks towards the future and contemplates our next move, we must have self-awareness. Our makeup is different than 10 years ago when Dr. Ross Lee spoke to this House of Delegates. We are bigger, younger, and more diverse. In 1892, A.T. Still saw the importance of allowing women and minorities into the American School of Osteopathy. Our profession must continue the trends of inclusion. And it's our leader responsibility to understand and guide the profession, not for who we used to be, but for who we are today and who we need to be in the future. Currently, 42% of all practicing DOs are females, and 66% are younger than 45. Our schools and affiliate societies are actively seeking diversity, and the AOA has created a strategic plan around comprehensive diversity, equity, and inclusion. We are filling gaps in underserved communities by placing medical schools in those areas of need, and a majority of our graduates are still going into family medicine where shortages exist. At the current trajectory, we may soon outnumber MDs in that field. DOs are seeking administrative appointments at astonishing rates. We now have had osteopathic physicians at NASA, the media, the White House, and Congress. This growth and opportunity allows our philosophy to penetrate and direct medicine in ways we could not have hoped for in the past. But it will only continue if we stay relevant and unified. We need not only include but cultivate leaders in the next generation. We need to partner with them to understand the former achievements, the historic blind spots, and create a vision that is inclusive to all generations. To better understand the diverse populations we represent, we must look towards leadership that reflects those trends. Creating a more diverse pool of mentors and continuing to mold new leaders is crucial for our survival. We still need the previous leaders and the, the protectors of the profession who laid all the groundwork to get here today. These giants paired with the new faces and ideals will continue to strengthen the progress of this profession. There have been some great examples lately. I looked to California, where Dr. Alexander Myers is holding her presidency at 36. I looked at Texas, where Dr. Aguilera just became the first Latina to lead the association. To Octavia Cannon, the first African-American female president of her specialty society. To Dr. Nichols, the only female president in 124 years of the AOA. I look to Mississippi, who identifies and promotes young leadership on a consistent basis, first with Dr. Ashley Hood and then Dr. Seeger Morris. I look at the Bureau of Merging Leaders, a group of students, postdoctoral trainees, and new physicians in practice, dedicated to sharing best practices that increase enrollment of young physicians. The AO is in the middle of a shift. They recognize in the race for relevance, it should not take 25 years to grow a leader. The diversity in viewpoint, vision, and historic knowledge is a blueprint for our success. And as leaders, we must embrace a mix of different races, ages, genders, and more, as it sends a message to the osteopathic community and our patients that we continue to be dedicated to the ideas our founder established. Our profession needs different doctors with differing viewpoints, some with historical understanding and some with brand new ways of thinking. The past is important and shaped who we are today, but it only matters if we're still present tomorrow. Just like a muscle needs an origin and insertion, so does osteopathic need mission and vision. The vision comes from mentoring new leaders and it comes from inclusiveness and diversity of people and ideas. It both penetrates and learns from the diverse communities in which we serve. It is with unity and this vision that we must push for improvements in the healthcare team, technology and innovation. Like I realized in Africa all those years ago, Medicine needs us. We must continue to do what osteopathic physicians do best. Improve health care for the people we're honored to call our patients. We must continue to embrace osteopathic history, innovation, and opportunities. This is our next move. This is how the AOA endures the challenges ahead and how we continue to live out AT Still's mission. Thank you.